everyone should be able to see my screen now and we're, we're on with it so welcome everyone thank you for uh, bearing with us there this session is part of the code connect events that's tied to vmworld 2021 this year and we're, today we're going to be looking at how we can pipeline tanzu kubernetes clusters using be realize automation my name's dean lewis and we've also got my colleague sam mcgowan with my, with us as well good evening everybody or good morning good afternoon wherever you are Thank you, Sam. Uh, so I work here in our cloud management business unit, uh, representing the field. Uh, Sam, if you want to quickly introduce yourself as well. Yep. So my name's Sam McGowan, and I'm part of the uh, technical marketing team for VRealize Automation, and uh, I specialize in CodeStream and sort of Kubernetes cloud native apps, that side of things. So we've only got a couple of slides to go through today, and then we're going to go really technical and heavy. So we're going to go through a little bit of scene setting. What is it we're trying to actually achieve today? Um, Sam's going to take us through CodeStream, the basics of it and how it plugs together and how it functions. And then I'm going to take you through the uh, pipeline design itself. And those kind of two areas are going to cross over into actually the live demo section as well. And then we'll finish off with some resources and how you can get hands on with the code that we go through today in our VMware hands on labs as well. So to kick things off, if we look at the scene settings, so what capabilities are available today for vRealize Automation to provide self-service Tanzu Kubernetes clusters in our environment? Unfortunately, I do have to start on a slight bad note. We don't actually have out-of-the-box support today for deploying Tanzu Kubernetes grid clusters, whether that's native in vSphere, whether it's part of our multi-cloud offering as part of vRealize Automation. That means it's not available as a drag and drop option in the canvas, for example. Um, however, no fear, this session is about how we address that today. And I also show you some of the extensibility features that are available and how you can interact with other products that are not uh, directly available or have a plug in or a native integration with VRA today. So this is going to take you through some of those more advanced concepts and use cases. Um, obviously for myself, we know there's a need for administrators to provide a self-service type delivery of Tanzu Kubernetes clusters to their users. They log into a service catalog and they request that, fill out a number of details such as where does the cluster get placed, what name is it given, maybe how many nodes within that cluster. But obviously we don't want that end user to actually be getting into the bare bones of the system and deploying that Kubernetes cluster itself. Using CodeStream and pipelines, we can build a chain of tasks together to build our resources, configure and integrate between systems as needed. And then again, we can provide that self-service capability by taking those pipelines and offering them as catalog items for our end users to consume via the service broker. Uh, a quick overview of the pipeline design that we're going to go through today, and this will make more sense as Sam does his uh, section on the CodeStream product itself. We're going to focus on what's called CI task, which is essentially using a container to replicate a number of given commands and tasks that we could run on our desktop or laptop to create a supervisor namespace inside vSense. We're actually going to be using Tanzu with vSphere as an integrated version here today, but we could also manipulate this to work with the multi-cloud offering as well. We're going to deploy a Kubernetes cluster inside of that namespace. We're then actually going to go into that Kubernetes cluster itself and start to create things like a service account in there. And then we're going to use that service account so that we can collect the necessary information about the cluster. And then we're going to take those details that we use within the tasks and we're going to create um, Kubernetes endpoints within VRA today as REST API calls. Um, but actually, we could that could be any other third party system. So I've also done some work previously where we integrate with Tanzimish Control to create a attach cluster that way instead as well. Um, but hopefully today, at the end of this session, you'll kind of understand how CodeStream works, how we can things together and also give you some ideas about how maybe you'd use this in your environments as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand over to Sam. Thank you. Let me just uh, fire up my share. Okay, so I'm going to give a, a brief overview uh, of CodeStream as a product, um, where it sits within uh, vRealize Automation, which is um, uh, available as both a cloud service and also as an on-premise uh, on-premises deployment. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is using the cloud service, so um, it's just a, a SaaS offering, uh, but it's identical to what's available uh, on-premises as well. So, um, if you've got VRA on-premises, then you've got 
all the features that you're going to see here um, with the caveat that it might be um, some of the latest features might might be a, a few sort of uh, point versions behind. So when you log into CodeStream, um, first of all, you'll log into vRealize Automation or vRealize Cloud, and you'll be presented with a with a bunch of uh, services which are available to you. Uh, and vRealize Automation comes with uh, Service Broker, Cloud Assembly, vRealize Orchestrator, and also uh, CodeStream, and uh, also now Salt Stack Config as well. And uh, CodeStream is really our, our sort of pipelining tool, uh, and obviously we, we can use that to, to automate solutions. Um, so when you log into CodeStream, you're presented with the, uh, the pipelines view. It's the first view that you'll see, um, and I will come back to this view in a minute. But um, I'm going to start walking you through how you would actually go about setting up the platform. Um, so first of all, one of the first tasks that you would do um, is configure projects um, and projects are sort of a logical boundary for um, your your uh, permission sets and for giving access to different uh, resources so for example um, you might have a, a project around events and you'll specify different users with different uh, permission levels within those projects and this means that the uh, the users within the projects will have the the role of administrator or a member or a viewer role. Uh, uh, administrative users will, um, I'll explain a little bit more around this later on, but administrative users will be able to access um, restricted variables and restricted endpoints. Uh, member users will be able to access uh, pretty much everything else and viewers will have a basically a, a read-only view. Um, so once you've configured a, a project, you can start setting up resources for that project to consume. And one of the resource types is an endpoint. Uh, and as you can see, we've we've got on on this uh, this uh, environment, it's got quite a few endpoints configured at the moment. Um, but each endpoint basically gives you uh, access to a set of resources. So you would uh, assign uh, a project first of all, to, to uh, allow that, that um, scope of the project to access this resource. And then we've got various different types of endpoints, and these endpoint types relate to task types that you can use later on. So for example, uh, you know, we have a, a Docker endpoint where you can interact with a, a Docker host, and this will allow you to, um, to execute um, tasks so scripts on within the context of a container, and I'll go into that in a little bit of detail later. Um, we can also uh, connect to a Kubernetes endpoint, um, and this allows you to run your CI tasks on, uh, on in the context of a Kubernetes workspace as well, which is a, a really relatively new feature, but it's something that's been really popular, uh, really requested. So um, I'm, I'm really pleased that we were able to do that now. Um, we can also have, we've also got um, Kubernetes tasks, which allow us to do things like um, create, uh, you know, deploy manifests, YAML manifests and um, delete and update and, and perform those sort of kubectl kind of commands. Um, but basically when we're creating an endpoint, uh, we're interacting with different systems of these types. So some of the ones that we use more frequently would be the Git endpoint, which allows us to kind of configure a, a Git repository and uh, depending on the repository type, um, it, we can uh, configure different options and that will allow us to pull code um, to create triggers based on uh, pull requests or um, uh, merge requests within the platform. Um, so again, they're, they're a very useful common uh, endpoint type. Uh, Jenkins, so we can call out Jenkins pipelines. Um, we can we can call out vRealize Orchestrator if you've already got libraries of Orchestrator workflows that have been built. So there are various different endpoint types that you're able to use. And then the the last section under the configure um, is the variable section. And so we've got three different types of variables, and these variables are available in the platform in the context of the project that they're available in. So uh, for example, this one, this project here will have access to this variable. Uh, and then we've got three different variable types. Uh, the first variable type is just a regular plain text variable. Uh, we then have a secret variable, which is, as you can see here, is, it's a secret, it's starred out. You'll never see that within the, within the platform, uh, printed in logs or anything like that. 
And then the, the last type that we, we have as well is the restricted type. And uh, you can see I can't create a restricted variable because I'm not an administrator in this project. Uh, but as I mentioned before, an administrator will be able to access and run uh, pipelines that are restricted and, and access restricted variables, whereas a non-administrator won't. So if we look at a project where I am an administrator, he said, selecting one that he's not, um, I should be able to create a, a restricted uh, variable there as well. So we've got these variables which we can use to customize the platform and to hide, keep our secrets. So we tend to put things like API keys, access tokens, passwords, anything that we're going to use that we don't necessarily want someone else to be able to see uh, in these variables. And then we can consume them in pipelines later on. So this is the sort of configuration um, of, the, of the endpoints and projects. So next, we'll have a quick look at uh, the the custom integrations um, and custom integrations are really uh, units of code that you want to be able to repeat uh, again and again and again and you can create inputs and outputs for a, a custom integration task uh, and then these can be reused within a pipeline um, and so when we create a custom integration we can create using uh, node.js uh, python or uh, shell script and uh, if we we can have a quick look at one um, we can see that you've got, uh, for example, this one's a Python runtime. Uh, we have the code that we want to execute using this custom task. And then we have things like the input properties and uh, we also have output properties. And what this will do is, is build up a form that we can use to capture inputs from the end user. And then we can return uh, variables from these, these tasks. Um, and these are very similar to a custom integration task that you'll see uh, in a pipeline in a second. Um, but these are designed to be sort of reusable units. So having mentioned pipelines and tasks, um, let's have a look at the, the meat of the product. So when we go in and we'll have a look at, uh, let's have a look at this task. Um, so when we come into a, a pipeline, uh, the first thing we'll see is that we have general pipeline configuration over on the right-hand side here. And we can configure things like the concurrency of the pipeline runs. Uh, so we might have a pipeline that we do not want to run twice for that will create race conditions or might consume too many resources. We can configure the concurrency down to one and then the pipelines will only execute sequentially after that. Or likewise, if we you know we need 50 pipelines to execute at the same time, then we can up that concurrency. And we can do things like uh, creating icons uh, that we add, which uh, make it look a little bit nicer or easily, more easily identifiable on the screen. Uh, and we can also uh, add tags to the platform as well. Um, and we can configure notifications for the entire pipeline. So we can create notifications uh, based on the condition of the pipeline. So whenever the pipeline completes or is waiting, it fails, it's canceled or it starts to run. Uh, we can have, a, have an event trigger, a, a notification. So we've got three different types here. Uh, email, which uh, is using the, uh, the email, the SMTP endpoint that we can configure in the endpoints. And we can start building up notifications to various uh, people. We can also use variables within this. So we can have, for example, the user ID that requested it, put it in the wrong field but we could use the user id of whoever's requested the pipeline and actually notify them if it fails or completes uh, and things like that and we can use those variables to build up um, so as i mentioned before you know we've got access to variables um, and we can start building out uh oh, i got a bit of a graphics glitch there because I've, I've increased the thing but we can we can build out the variables that we're using uh, in that project uh, we can also, uh, with the JIRA endpoint, we can integrate with JIRA and we can raise tickets, for example, when if the pipeline was to fail um, or uh, close tickets if the uh, pipeline completes. And then there's a more generic uh, webhook, uh, which allows us to post, put and patch uh, against a URL. Uh, we can add headers and then uh, a payload. So, for example, integrating within another third party ticketing system or doing uh, any other kind of integration that will allow us to access a REST API or something like that. 
uh, we can we can do that using the webhook notification. So that's all generic configuration for this pipeline run. Uh, now the pipeline itself can take inputs. So we can create generic input variables and those are available in the life cycle of that uh, pipeline. Uh, we have the workspace, which is the context in which our pipeline executes. Uh, so if we have various uh, CI tasks, they will be executing in the context that we configure here. Um, and this one doesn't actually have a huge amount of configuration. Um, we're just running against a particular Docker endpoint, um, but we could also configure and, and run against, for example, that's a, a, a Azure Kubernetes service um, that, that's in the cloud. And so this allows us to have a fully cloud-based uh, pipeline running tasks within our Azure Kubernetes and uh, and going off and, and doing various things without ever hatch, having to be on, on our premises. Uh, which is quite cool. Um, so, as I said, this is the context in which uh, our pipeline executes, and we can use an image builder URL, which is the the container image in which we're going to execute our tasks. Uh, we can configure uh, Docker endpoint, uh, Docker registry endpoint. Uh, for example, if we've got uh, a container image that's behind uh, credentials uh, on Docker Hub, we can we can use the image registry or the container registry endpoint to provide those credentials and give us access to that uh, container context. Uh, when we're using Kubernetes, we can create a namespace and we've got a choice between using a, a node port or a load balancer on that Kubernetes host. Um, and I won't go into all these details now because it will take us time, but there's various different uh, environment variables, storage, configuration, folders, caching, uh, CPU and memory limits available to us. And all of this basically sets up the context for the execution of the pipeline. And so when we come to building the, the model of our pipeline, this is the this is this is the uh, pipeline itself. We have various different stages here so I've got to deploy MySQL configure NSX and then I've got to deploy open cart stage in this pipeline uh, and I've got a palette of various different task types on this left hand side here and these these are all um, relating to or mostly relating to endpoints that we would have configured within that endpoint so for example uh, the uh, say the Kubernetes task which we've got one of down here will be against a Kubernetes endpoint. Uh, and then we configure this particular task uh, and all of the tasks have stuff that's uh, generic. So for example, the task name, uh, the type of task, there'll be a field for which type of task you wanna use. Um, we can configure preconditions. So we can say if this previous task failed or if this previous task succeeded, do this, or if the output of this task was higher than 20, you know, uh, you get the idea we can we can create conditional runs of tasks as well <clears throat> we can also configure uh, to continue on failure or we or we can uh, fail the pipeline on the failure of a task and then once you get down past those generic configurations um, you get into the task particular task type properties so for example what kubernetes cluster we're targeting and what action we're going to do so we're going to do uh, an apply task here uh, we're grabbing the source code, so the source YAML from source control. So we're grabbing it from our Git repository and there's a particular file. Uh, and then we're going to do some parameter replacement within our YAML file. Um, well, there you go, my home automation has just switched all my lights off. Should have turned that off, shouldn't I? And I'll let you who'd be in your office. <laughs> <laughs> who, who'd, let you, who'd be in their office at eight o'clock at night, hey? <clears throat> okay, so uh, that's, uh, you know, the, the Kubernetes task type. Um, and as I mentioned, there's, there's loads of different task types. So for example, this is a, a pipeline task, which allows us to execute uh, another pipeline. So we can nest pipeline executions within each other. And then we, we just get the, the inputs and the outputs for that pipeline available to us within the parent uh, pipeline task. Um, similarly, and one of the most commonly used uh, for integrating with third party systems is, is the REST task. And this just gives us a generic REST client to be able to access any of the, any of the, um, you know, the, the configuration that we want to do, headers, um, the type of action that we're going to post, 
Um, we can have conditional um, URLs. So for example, here, I'm accessing that variable for the NSX manager. Um, and so that allows me to, to make this pipeline executable in different contexts as well. Um, so yeah, other, other notable task types. Uh, another one that we, we use a lot is this CI task here. If I drag it onto, well, I'll just create one on here, he says. Um, the CI task type allows us to run against that workspace that we were talking about before, allows us to run a bunch of scripts. So this is a, a, um, you know, a bash script. So I'm, I'm just literally typing in my, my bash script into this continuous integration task. And then we've got various options on this task, but this allows us to, for example, run a container that has the Tanzu Kubernetes grid CLI in it, for example, uh, if we wanted to integrate into those things. So we've got a whole bunch of pipeline tasks here that gives us a, a sort of a big Swiss army knife of tools that we can do. You know, we can SSH to hosts, we can run PowerShell scripts on a PowerShell host, uh, or even call out to that um, vRealize orchestrator server and run, run our workflows from there. So once we've executed our pipelines, um, we can see the output from them and the, and the process of them in the executions. So you can see here, I've got you know uh, the most recent executions uh, listed along here. Uh, I've been developing this pipeline, so obviously it fails most of the time until I eventually get it right. Um, but if, for example, I want to have a look at a particular one, I can click through and that takes me to this executions uh, tab up here and you can see the execution stages of the pipeline uh, you can have a look at the overall stage status you can have a look at the status of each sub task and if it if in the case of this one this is a, a sub pipeline here i could actually go in and look at the execution of the child pipeline as well um, so we can really look at what's happening within the workspace so we get logging within the workspace we can have a look at the output of that task um, and if we select an actual task itself, we can we can actually see the the JSON that is allowing us to sort of look at the response from this particular task. So it allows us to dig right into the troubleshooting details. Um, and on this executions tab, you're going to see all of your recent executions. You can see at a glance, you know, the first stage completed, second stage failed. You can see the error message that is failing it. Um, and that you know that this allows you to very quickly have a look and see okay this is this has failed here you can dig into the stage that failed and, and look at the logs and, and figure out what's gone wrong in that particular one okay so the config map already exists on that on that log so it's it's a, a sort of your your troubleshooting and uh, and all, all of the ways to look at the execution successful or failures of your pipeline uh, and all of this information can be bubbled up into these custom and uh, these dashboards for the pipelines which are provided. So if we go in and have a look at uh, this one, for example, it's going to say in the last 14 days, there's one completed and four failed. Um, we can see various things like the, the statistics on the, the execution, mean time to failure, six minutes, okay. Uh, mean time to retry 23 hours or looks like I tried one each day then um, and uh, mean time to deploy so that's the the average time it takes to actually execute the pipeline um, and this one is quite a simple pipeline stage here uh, and there's only one build but you can imagine if you've got 15 steps you could see a trend over time of maybe it fails in step six in stage to stage six or whatever so it allows you to uh, to create to just have a very quick overview of all of these different um, all of these different statistics around your pipeline execution, and that's great for a single execution. If you want to maybe pull in the information for a whole bunch of different uh, pipelines, you can uh, you can actually create your own custom dashboards, and you can bring in information from various different pipelines into your own custom dashboard, uh, and that's quite useful if you're you know you're running a pipeline. 10, 15 times a day, and you want to create some statistics around that to have an overview of what's going on. And the last thing that I shall talk about before I hand back to Dean is the triggers. Uh, what triggers allow us to do um, is, uh, I'm going to give you an example of, of the Git trigger, um, but it's exactly the same for Docker or, or Garrett. 
um, it allows us to create a webhook and we configure uh, the webhook within here. Uh, we provide details, uh, for example, a secret token, what branch we want to do this on. Uh, we can configure the inclusion or exclusion of files. And we can say when, when on a push request, uh, on a push to the repository or on a pull request, um, we want to trigger a pipeline. So for example, we want to trigger this MOAD bootcamp pipeline every time there's a push to this repository. And uh, this repository is, is one of my Git endpoints. And what this does is allow us to execute uh, a pipeline every time there's a every time this code pushed to our Git repository. So you can have uh, automatic testing triggered on your code. You can have automatic builds triggered. Um, but there's a huge amount of flexibility in what you're able to do here. And similarly, you can do this with with a Docker endpoint. So if you've if you've pushed a new version of your container you can actually roll out that new container to your test environment, run some testing, um, you know, approve it, move it out onto production um, and, and do all that sort of automation uh, re relatively easily. So what that comes in, what that looks like in, in here, in the activity is you can see that when someone's made a push request, um, we've got, for example, a change subject to come in, we can see who uh, actually made that commit. Um, and then we can also see, well, this is the related execution to that, um, to that execution, uh, that trigger, and actually go in and look at that trigger while it's, uh, and, and have a look at what's happened. Uh, obviously, it's failed there. So that is, uh, that is a whirlwind overview of, uh, of CoStream. Uh, I'm just going to quickly give a shout out to this website here, which is a website that our, my team's been working on. Uh, learncodestream.github.io. It's um, hopefully going to be a resource that everyone can use to actually learn CodeStream. And we're going to try and uh, keep that populated with examples and everything like that. But it's also open sourced. So you can go in and you can um, go straight to GitHub and actually uh, fork the code and add, edit, and get involved there as well. So um, enough plugging that one i'm going to hand back over to dean and he's going to take us through the uh, the rest of the demo thank you very much sam so that was quite a whistle stop tour um as sam mentioned we've thrown a lot of information there to you as well so we're just quickly going to recap the pipeline design i will also give a shout out we've got the learn codestream.github.io uh, workspace uh, for you to look at you can contribute code to that and we'd love for people to do that in the community as well we do also actually have it turns out and i only found out this last night um we do also do this for the other products as well so um we've also got salt stack in there for example cloud assembler as well um and i think it's learn cloud assembly learn salt stack dot uh github.io and i think if sam wants to just drop them into the chat for me i do actually think there is now a learn vrealize automation dot github.io i think that's the master holding page for it all if i remember correctly there is there is that's correct and um, so sam's thrown a lot of information at you there um and we know it's a lot to take in during this session which is one of the reasons why it's recorded one of the reasons why we're giving you these resources and we'll recap these on the last slide as well i'm just quickly going to go back through what we're trying to achieve with this pipeline design now that you understand the concepts so we're going to use these CI tasks, which is using the container to run bash scripts and just, just certain commands with uh, the TKG CLI tooling that comes down from the vCenter. Um, we're actually going to use it, create a supervised namespace by calling an existing cloud template. We're going to deploy a Tanzu Kubernetes grid cluster using a CI task that, um, that um, uh, uh, escapes me the word for it, the TKG CLI to do that with once we've authenticated using the kubectl vSphere plugin. I'm going to configure that service count. I'm going to collect the information about the cluster, and then we're going to use REST API tasks to call back to VRA itself to create the Kubernetes endpoints in Cloud Assembly and Coldstream. Um, OK, so on to the rest of the demo. I did actually put a slide in for this at the time. As you can see, me, me and Sam are, were a little bit thrown by the technical issues for making this super smooth. So I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger for everyone. 
So first and foremost, um, to be able to create supervised namespace, this because we're using the integrated version vSphere with Tanzu, we can do supervised and namespace creation natively within VRA. That's kind of where the support starts and end for TKG integration today. We need to end our uh, add our cloud account in for our vCenter. Once we've authenticated and allowed provisioning, we can see here if workload management is enabled, we'll get this little green tick, which means we can uh, configure Kubernetes zones. We then create a Kubernetes zone within Cloud Assembly, which allows us to provision to that cluster as well. And if need be, we can create capability tags there so we can reference that in the code. We then add that into our project, which means when the users are provisioning, they've got the ability to one, provision VMs and so forth into these different locations, but they've also a separate uh, Kubernetes provisioning for that same zone as well, even if that vSphere exists as a cloud zone already for provisioning virtual machines, you need to do this for Kubernetes as well. And what that essentially gives us, if I go to our design tab now, is we can then deploy a cloud template. Um, and again, it'll give you the access to the blog with all the details on for all this code we've used today. Um, we're going to create the object of a supervisor namespace and all we're going to do in there is very very simple we're telling it what constraints so we're linking that capability tag to make sure it gets deployed to the right zone in our demo lab today we only have the one zone so that wouldn't be a problem but one of the best practices to use capability tags when you've got multiple zones multiple zones uh, uh cloud zones to deploy to to control things go in the right area. Um, you start early with stuff like this in designs, it pays off dividends in the future. And we're just going through the very simple um, user import for a namespace name when it's created in our vCenter. I've then published this as a version. So we can see here, I've got the last version available and we need that to be published so it's available within CodeStream itself. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm doing this using the um, uh, cloud assembly here is I could actually use a REST API call to vCenter to do this instead, but I've decided to do this instead using cloud assembly. And one of the reasons for that is because we're going to use some rollback functionality. So if something goes wrong in the pipeline, it can easily clean up everything that it's tried to build because everything's contained within that vSphere supervisor namespace. So if we go into code stream, if I click on my pipelines, I've got two pipelines created. First one is delete deployment. So we're going to go into that first. And this essentially is what I'm going to use to clean up everything if things fail and roll back. Very simple, single task, VMware Cloud template. The action is to delete a deployment and we need the deployment name. And I'm going to put an input in there as a deployment name. So whenever it's run, we need to provide the, the deployment name. However, we're actually going to create that deployment name in our other pipeline. So our pipeline will be aware of the user inputs to create that deployment name. And therefore, if a failure happens, it's aware of how to pass that input through to this other nested pipeline. So I'm going to exit out here. So we're going to go into our main pipeline. This is where kind of all of our work happens. So I'm just going to go through to the um, input tab to begin with so the same way that we have with cloud assembly where we can do user inputs we can also do this at a pipeline level as well so i've specified a number of default settings here with these user inputs when we create them we don't get the same control over what the user can do for these um, inputs that we would in cloud assembly so you can't control them through regex or if it's an integer or a string or you can't do um, key value pairs for example of a list however once you expose this through service broker you do have the ability to add that additional governance through a custom form and if we've got time towards the end of the session i'll quickly show you some of that as well and um, here i've obviously filled out some of these defaults myself just when i run this pipeline i don't have to keep putting in the same information in our workspace, I'm using actually a Docker host rather than a Kubernetes environment today. And then I'm pointing that at my Kubernetes image. That Kubernetes image, if, if you do want to recreate this in your environment today, is available in Docker Hub. Um, but as Sam mentioned, sometimes when using Docker Hub, you do get rate limited as well, especially when we use this internal because there's so many things connecting to Docker Hub. So uh, we're hosting this on our own Harbor image registry as well internally. And then finally, we get back to this main pane view the model view which is where everything's working so sam mentioned this built up of two main areas that were interesting the stages and then the tasks that are linked within each stage 
as soon as we start to run through this, so how are we actually going to deploy our Kubernetes cluster? Well, the first thing that I want to do, and again, for this part, it doesn't really matter where I've put it. I've just decided to do it right at the start. I need to actually get an authentication token to interact with uh, VRA as an API. So I'm doing a REST call. I'm calling out. I'm going to specify a variable here. So this is the first variable I'm using from the system itself. This is always going to be hard coded and specified because I don't need it as a user input because VRA is going to always stay the same endpoint. We're passing that username body. Again, if I wanted, this could be a user input. If I wanted the users to pass through their credentials or um, we're going to use the system credentials for this. And if I scroll down, we're going to see the headers by default that are passed as part of this REST call. And what's very important here is to note the number of available outputs for this particular task type. So we can see here we've got status outputs, we've got output of response code, headers, body, and JSON. And one thing that we're going to be interested in here is some of these outputs, because this is where we get our bearer token when we authenticate to VRA. And we're going to use that at the end point of our stages. We're actually going to take that bearer token from this particular task in this stage and pass it through into another REST API call later on. If I go into my second stage, create supervisor namespace, First thing that I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to use the pipeline task to call the cloud template and create that cloud template for me um, as a deployment. So we select the cloud template, we select deployment, we select the deployment name. As we can see here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the variable of requested by. So it's going to take my username that I'm logged in the system with. And then I'm also going to append the inputs from the user, which is the supervisor namespace, which hopefully should be unique in the platform. The template source is Cloud Assembly because it's already built in Cloud Assembly. But if we wanted, we could actually call this from source control as well, whether that's GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, for example. So again, you maybe start to think about other areas of how you could iterate code and design and deployments in VRA using CodeStream as part of your CI CD pipelines for testing when you're committing into source control as well and tie that together with Git Trigs if you wanted. Obviously, we select the, um, the template name that we're interested in. We want to select the released version. So I've only released a single version here, which is good. And then the next thing that we have then is the imports. So we can see the input within that template is called ns-name. And what I'm actually pulling through here is the input from my pipeline itself when it's going to be run. Once this task runs, the next thing that I need to do is I actually need to run some additional actions and the reason for that is very simple the feature releases for the workload uh, uh workload management feature within vSphere gets updates before they're available in vra in terms of native integration so we've seen this happen with the ability for storage which became a mandatory parameter as part of a namespace and then vm class as well VRA now actually does support the ability to set the storage parameter in place, but doesn't support in the cloud template to add in VM class. So an easy way around that, again, is to make an API call um, to the vCenter and basically configure that once the namespace is created. Now, we could do that using the REST API call function, or we could use these types of custom integrations where we just run a one-off uh, Python code or Node.js code at that moment in time. So if I just quickly duplicate my view here and i come out this pipeline and very quickly i know sam already showed you an example of this with custom integration but i'll show you the one we've got here go on that adds the storage to the supervisor namespace and um, actually i've added this to also add in um vm class as well but this is just using python so here we say we're specifying the runtime as python we specify what happens is our code and everything else in here is just a set of python on the right hand side as sam mentioned then we start to build out these user inputs so we've got some specifications here of defaults for these inputs as well which may or may not work in our environment um if i then need to release this uh version of the code so I enter a number or a syntax, or I could give it a name, click release version, and that makes it available to my pipeline as well. I can also go through version history if I wanted to see what's changed with my current draft and my release drafts. And I can also restore to an earlier version as well or deprecate those released versions. So we've got code control in there as well as we start to build up those ideas of custom integration. But essentially this is drag and drop and run the code in there as you need rather than having to build out a full VRO workflow um, in Fee Realize Orchestrator, for example. So if we go back into my pipeline, we see we've selected the custom here. 
we can see we've pulled through all of these details of these imports and I've then changed these to specify where we're pulling through system variables and where we're going to do user inputs as well to add these details in. Then we move on to the next stage and this is where we start to really take advantage of these CI tasks. So I'm going to log into my environment and the first thing I need to do is actually, once I've created the supervised namespace, I need to log into it. So the first thing that I do is I will go off and I will download the vSphere plugin and the tools that come from the vCenter itself. And that makes sure that within my container, I've always, always got the right version of the tools with the vCenter that I'm connected to. I could bake this tool set into my container, but then it's a chicken and the egg scenario from version control. Yes, you cause an extra traffic every time you run this container to pull down those tools, but you make sure it's the right version. These things maybe you want to think of as a trade-off. The next thing we need to do is we need to think about how do we actually log into the environment. So if we're running this from our desktop, we just do kubectl vSphere login, provide the server name, provide a username. We can't provide an argument of a password, which is a slightly problematic. So that is a return on the interpreter when we log in. So by using the tool expect, we can write a script to say when we run this command, expect the interpreter response of password and then this is how you then send the right data to it for that login in an automated fashion and we can see that being built out here and essentially we're creating a script which runs these commands for us then we're modifying that to be um, uh, executable within our environment now if we're running a script like this to log into an environment we have to run this every time we use a ci task because the persistence will not stay in place for that login for the kubectl command between CI tasks, but the file will stay in place um, in a working directory that's temporary. You do also have the ability to set a persistent working directory as well, where outputs of files that happen within your tasks, maybe create SSH keys, for example, on demand, you can then preserve them and pull them from the environment so that they can be used by users. Myself and Sam have wrote a little bit of a uh, a page on how to use some of that in a more dynamic way in the learncodestream.io, uh, sorry, .github.io page as well, if you're interested in that piece. We move on to the next task. This is where we're going to create our Tanzu Kubernetes grid cluster. So we log in with the expect script, which authenticates us to the Kubernetes endpoint running in vCenter through the supervisor cluster. We create our YAML file, which specifies how to build the cluster. Some of these will take user inputs. Some of these are hard coded. Again, you could change these to be more user inputs or system variables, or even you may want to pull some data from a CMDB and then push it through as well if you wanted. Um, there's a number of options from that point of view. We then make sure that we're in the right context of our cluster, and then we apply that cluster YAML file. Now, the next thing we need to do and think about here at CI task is once we've applied that, because Kubernetes is declarative, it's just going to go off and say, right, I've done that. I've pushed that configuration to the, uh, to the Kubernetes endpoint, D. That's it. It's going to happen. The task's running. So now we're in our CI task, we need to think about, well, how do we get a status back? How do we make it fail inside of the pipeline if this doesn't actually create a cluster? So another CI task, and we're just going to do something really basic here, which is, again, log in, make sure we're at the, say, the right context. We're going to do the kubectl get towns of kubernetes grid cluster command and we're going to look for the phase or the status of that particular cluster and what we're waiting for is for that return response to be running and we just run a quick while loop in here to say what's current status isn't running keep going through and then eventually it comes back to build complete now here in my basic code, we know that this is not probably the best way to do this because actually if it turns to fail the status, we have no error handling in here. So we could build that out a little bit more, but as a proof concept, you can see how this builds up. Once we hit in this loop in our task that the build's completed, so we get the status back of running, which means the, the cluster's available in the environment, we move on to our next stage. So we now need to create another login script, which logs us directly into the new guest cluster that's been created in workload management. We do the same method again, which is setting um, the expect script. We set it to be executable, and then we use that for logging on. We log on in our next task, and then we create a file and apply that to create our service account. And this is going to generate a service account inside of Kubernetes, and it's going to give a token for that account as well. Before we can use that, we need to create a role binding. 
So here, by this point, we're actually interacting directly with the brand new Kubernetes cluster that's been created on demand. Um, once we've applied for this role binding, that account's now available. And then we move to our last stages of our tasks. So this way we're going to integrate it with third party systems. So here we're going to use VRA, but this could be another third party system. This, um, or we may want to output these details to a CMDB, for example, if you so wanted. So I have a CI task within my integration to VRA. So we're going to collect all that cluster information that we need in our REST API calls as the body information to be able to create these uh these endpoints so here i'm just logged in again into that cluster using that next expect script in the ci task and we're running through a number of creating system variables with uh, sorry yep system variables within the ci task here using the export command running the various commands that we need we're manipulating the output of that data on the fly as well to make sure that we remove things like https getting the right fingerprint making sure we get the right part of the fingerprint, making sure that we um, cut off anything that's not needed. We get the token name from the secret that we've created as well. We then get the token data and we base 64 decode that. And then we get things like the um, certificates as well, because we're using self-signed certificates within this environment. And one of the things that we need to do when we interact with VRA, for example, as an endpoint, is we need to be able to provide that fingerprint for that token um for the sl certificate to validate it being added if we don't provide that it won't add it into vra because it doesn't trust it the important thing with this task here though is we've created all of these variables but they will not live beyond this ci task so then we can use something like the export here and we map the export here to the variable name that we're interested in and this makes it available as an output data within the pipeline to other tasks so then if we look at our final task, because both these essentially do the same job, we've got a REST task to create an endpoint in CodeStream and a REST task to create an endpoint in Cloud Assembly. We go through, we create a REST task, we use one of these preconditions that Sam talked about before. So as long as the user input equals yes, then we'll add this into CodeStream. The same for Cloud Assembly as well. We create a post back to the VRA endpoint, and then we go through our body. We're again taking these user inputs because we want to rep represent the same names that we talked about earlier. However, now we also need to grab data from within the pipeline that's been generated at that point in time as we've run the pipeline. So we can do that again by calling the stage name, then we call the task name, we then call the output area, and then we call the exports is where we want to get the data from. And obviously we want the API server, the token and the fingerprint. And then finally, when we send this post, post command, we also need to authenticate to VRA when we do this. So we send that as a header. So again, we can specify our manual, our headers, and we again can do the same. So again, we call that very first stage and very first task. That at the start of our pipeline, we get the output, but here we're interested in the response headers. When you actually use CodeStream to start building this, it will start to auto-complete this for you as well um, for some of the areas. But when we get to the end of response headers, for example, it won't go any further to auto-complete that because it doesn't understand what response headers are going to be available when it runs that REST command because it's not run yet. It's part of the pipeline and we're generating this on the fly. So you will have to know what headers are available to be able to reference. So then you manually type that in. I know the header of authorization is going to be available when we authenticate here. So it will be available as part of this task and we can go through the authorization. I'll also show you a very quick way of being able to figure some of this stuff out as well when we create this. So that's our pipeline in a, in a little bit of a detailed fashion. If I click run, we can go through. I'm just going to give this one a uh, code live. We'll give it a supervised namespace of code live as well, because we're doing this on our live version of the event. I can then view the execution. And the execution is going to go through building the workspace that's running the container and then running through each of these stages. Obviously, this takes a few minutes to go through and then takes about 20 minutes or so, I think, to deploy this. So here's one that I built earlier. We can actually see before I go into that, that my earlier task today, I actually failed this. And we can see that it automatically hit the rollback. And we can see we've got another triggered task, which is to delete the deployment because this rollback triggered that particular delete deployment. If I go into my successful build, 
we can see all the details so actually it's 15 minutes to run this today if i go to authentication we can see the output data here as sam mentioned before we can also click on the view output json and one of the really cool things in here as well is if i just do um authorization oh no that's not going to work let's try date oh it's not going to work on this one it's typical i'll show you on the next one so i know it definitely works there it's case sensitive ah oh, thank you sam this is why i have sam around there we go so we can see if we were running this as a test and we needed to reference this data in another part of our pipeline if we just run this particular task as a test we can use this view output and find the path within the API uh, within the run in the pipeline itself. And this is then how we can reference it in our other tasks as well within Coldstream. So actually it's built in there to help you build out your pipelines going forward as well. If I just click through a few of these, we can see we create our supervisor namespace. We can see the response details we get from VRA when it creates all of this. We can see what happens when we run our custom tasks. We can see this Python running. We can see our output that we've put into there as well, where we call out the uh, MOAD names from in uh, the vSphere environment itself. When we create the logins, we can see the output as if we're just running this from our desktop. And then we can see what happens. We run through each of these different tasks as well. And then if I go to an API task at the end, the same again as we do this. And the end result here for us is I have an endpoint called Code Connect because this was the one that I run earlier. And if I go into my vSphere environment, we can see we've already got one that I created earlier called VM VMworld 2021. It's created our cluster and it's created our uh, virtual machines in there based on that YAML code. And then at the moment, we've got this one that's happening live in the environment, which is going to take a couple of minutes to actually start building everything in there as well. So that was a really whistle stop tour. I think we've got a couple of minutes now. So where do we take this further? Well, we go back to that self-service usage. So the last thing we want to do here is we would release our pipeline into service broker. We go into service broker itself, into our content. We'd make sure we've got Coldstream pipelines in there. We make sure that these pipelines are shared out to our correct uh, project. So we can see here, I've got my deploy vSphere namespaces. And as catalog item, this becomes available. I'm not going to show you how to manipulate the form today, but we do have the ability to do that. But if I was just an end user requesting a Kubernetes environment that I wanted on the vSphere platform, and I wasn't given access to the back end to build the pipeline, I can just go in here and I've got a form that I can fill out nice and easily as a app or a developer team member. I fill out these details and then depending on how that pipeline's uh, set up, such as using notifications, as Sam went through earlier, I may get an email at the end of this successful deployment saying, hey, Dean, your cluster's created here's how you log on to it, or here's the team you need to speak to to get your RBAC access directly into the cluster as well. Okay, so let's go back when I can find PowerPoint. I've just got some Zoom stuff in the way there. So how can you take this further for everyone that's kind of been through this whistle stop tour with us? So a number of resources. So we've got a short code there for the blog to go through, which actually takes you through the particular code we've just been talking about for the last 10, 15 minutes. Um, learn.codestream, uh, learn uh, learncodestream.github.io to actually just learn Codestream itself and go through more detail what Sam's talked about. And really helpfully, some of our colleagues working in CMBU in the field and beyond have actually created a hands-on lab, a cloud management journey from monolith to modern apps to the vRealize suite, made up of a number of modules and touches all of the vRealize cloud management suite here today. But module six in particular focuses on these exact pipelines and delivery that we've talked about today. And if you spin up that hands-on lab, you can actually deploy some Tans Kubernetes grid clusters and play about with that pipeline yourself. Really handy if you don't have the ability to do that in a demo or a lab environment yourself at home today or in your workplace, you can do that from VMware's free accessible hands-on labs. So we're gonna bring this to an end now. Remind everyone to take the survey. The feedback means a lot to us. We want to improve sessions like this going forward and know what your use cases is, are as well. So last thing from myself is thank you very much for everyone that's joined today. Again, sorry for the an original hiccups at the start there. Do apologize about that. Any questions or queries, you can find myself or Sam on Twitter as well. Please do reach out and get in touch with us. You'll also see the pair of us knocking about on the VMworld Slack as well.